Hello, I'm Carlos Sang and you're watching SUTV. Uh, tonight I'm at the Swansea Grand Theatre where um, I'm very glad to be joined by uh, one of the West End's finest leading men and one of tonight's performers, Mr John Owen Jones. Hi, lovely to have you tonight. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Um, yeah, so you recently just came back from the Free Phantom store in China. Yeah. Um, you've performed all over the world on the West End and Broadway stages. Uh, what is it like coming back to Wales to perform? Oh, it's always amazing, I and mean, the audiences are brilliant. Uh, last night I was in Burryport, my hometown, performing there, and tonight Swansea, and um, everyone's always up for a good time. Mm. I'm not sure whether it's something in the air in Wales where everyone's a bit crazy, but uh, yeah, audiences are always great here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one of the roles that you're most famous for playing is Jean Valjean in Les Miserables. So you start, first started playing the role in 1998 at the age of 26. Yeah. Uh, you've played the role on Broadway, on tour, and most recently in the 2019 stage concert. Yeah. Um, how has your view changed? of Les Miserables and of um, Jean Valjean changed over the years? Well, um, when I first did it, I was too young, really. Um, yeah. And I remember um, going back a few years later, after having done it at 26, you know, a role like that at 26 is a gift, and mm. it's something you couldn't turn down. But really, I mean, you shouldn't be playing a role like King Lear at that age, you know, and it's yeah. kind of like the equivalent musical theatre role of King Lear, you know, yeah. it's a huge ask of any actor to perform mm. that. Um, but I went back a few years later after I got married and had two children and my performance changed yeah. changed without me realising it but people were commenting on it and how more mature it was and everything so um, I've grown through the role as I've grown up I've changed uh, I've seen more of the world and that influences how I perform the role um, and I've been very lucky to have loads of different opportunities Cameron McIntosh has you know let me play the role on Broadway twice I've played it in Paris I've played it at the Barbican I've played it in every major theatre it's ever been in in London including the O2 and um, and um, you know, it's been an incredible journey for me to be part of that, such an iconic show. And uh, uh, incredibly, it's a role I don't think I'll ever get bored of. Mm. Um, you've worked with some of the best in the business. So you just mentioned Cameron McIntosh, but you've also worked with uh, Michael Ball, uh, Dame Emma Thompson, uh, Keith Jack, Sierra Bogas. Um, is there anyone else you'd still like to work with in the future? Um, I've always been a big fan of Mandy Patinkin, and that'd be quite interesting mm. because I heard so many interesting stories about his off-stage antics. Um, but he's he's one of the uh, performers that's influenced how I see my career. I mean, he's always been someone that's not just stuck in one genre, like musicals. He does plays, he does concerts, he does recordings, he does films, you know. And so I've kind of tried to spread my wings like he has. So he'd be very interesting to work with. Um, but apart from him, really, um, I've kind of worked with all the people I've wanted to work with. Um, it's directors and writers I, I, I'm interested in working with. You know, I'd love to work with someone like um, Tarantino or uh, Spielberg. <laughs> I mean, it's never going to happen, but you know, it's that kind of thing. Because they have a very interesting and incredibly successful take on on, on the business of theatre and film. And um, I'd love to work with people like that, people who inspire me. You know. Mm. Um, so I want to take you back to November 13th. So you were covering a show for Alfie Bow yeah. in the Limes stage concert. As you were taking your vows, a woman in the dress circle yelled, where's Alfie? And yeah. began to swear and heckle you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, your co-star Carrie Hope Fletcher, she quickly came to your defence on social media. And in the past, she's also cited her concerns around fan behaviour at stage door. Is audience etiquette on the decline? Um, I think it's always been the same. I mean, that was a particular instance where uh, I think this woman had had a lot of drink and, you know, alcohol is not anyone's friend really when you've had too much and also you know she might have been to see four or five shows and spent a lot of money and Alfie was off sick for each one mm -hmm. and you know the last one was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, I tend not to worry about things like that myself. Um, Carrie is, is very um, vocal about things on, on Twitter and Instagram and stuff mm -hmm. and you know if she's got the time to do that good luck to her and she's a dear friend and I was very happy about what she said but um, but it was uh, it was a very interesting occasion, really, and uh, not something. I, mean, I actually enjoyed it. That's a weird thing. I enjoyed the really? the heckle because I, I I kind of like I threw something back out at her and uh, you know made the audience laugh because when she said "Where's Alfie?" Yeah. the whole audience went "Oh!" like that, you know, like. And I said, oh, ma'am, ma'am, please don't embarrass me in public. And everyone just deflated the situation immediately. And that's how you deal with people like that, you know I mean? The, the most annoying thing really as an actor is um, people not paying attention to you. Um, you know, they might be on their phones or something like that, or getting up to go to the loo or something. But you can't, you can't help that. It's the way we are now. But they paid their money. They can do whatever they want. You know, that's how I see it. And I try not to let it bother me. I mean, I've nearly stopped shows, um, you know, I'm sure lots of actors have, and I know actors actually have stopped them, but you might see someone that's re repeat offender and it's like putting off for the people around them and spoiling their enjoyment, and it's like, I don't care what 
it happens to me it's the other people that have paid to come out and have a good time that they're getting their night ruined and that's what that that's what annoys me but you know people will be people you can't do anything about it really of course yeah so um i want to ask you a little bit about the phantom of the opera as yeah. well yeah the new production which you, of les mis which you originally toured with one yeah. recently just went into the west end mm -hmm. um and you toured with a new production of phantom mm -hmm. um, a few years ago um do you expect phantom to take a similar route as les mis and have a new production moving in i don't think it will no mm -hmm. i don't think it will um it was an interesting period of time actually um getting asked to reimagine both these iconic roles was a great honour. Um, Les Mis was uh, particularly enjoyable because Claude Michel Schoenberg and Alan Boublil were around and uh, we had access to all the original material and things like that and uh, it was a very creative um, room. Um, but the Phantom Tour was slightly different because Lloyd Webber wasn't around and uh, Cameron McIntosh was working on the film. So it kind of got, it kind of went down a different track. Um, and I think that production now, they're doing a new touring production around the UK, which is a slightly amended version of the West End. Mm. Uh, it's just as spectacular. But Cameron McIntosh is a, he's an incredibly clever businessman, a great marketer. And he saw the potential that, you know, with Les Mis to sell it to a new audience with a new production. Um, and also people who've seen it before will come back and experience the new version. And he tried to do that with Phantom as well. And I think that version is touring around America. Mm. But I think it's... I, ironically, it's actually probably too big to fit into a Western theatre. I mean, the set was absolutely enormous, but designed to collapse, to be folded up and put on trucks very quickly, which you can't do with the original production of Phantom because of the chandelier, they have to close the roads to strengthen ceilings and all this kind of thing. It's an enormous, you know, enormous uh, uh, thing to take on board, but the new production, even though the set is bigger and probably more expensive and more spectacular, yeah. um, it's easy to tour, but probably harder to fit into a West End theatre, ironically. So I don't think it probably will happen. Oh, OK. Um, so going back to, um, quickly back to Les Mis, um, John Robbins, who recently just opened the new uh, yeah. West End production, um, he recently told Broadway World that um, before going into the world, he tried to steal as much as he could from you. <laughs> um, what advice did you give to John Robbins and what advice would you give to actors going into shows like Les Mis and Phantom? Um, steal from people you admire. I mean, that's <laughs> what we all do. That's what actors should do. And that's something that Michael Caine said once, and I'd like, well, if, you know, it works for him. So basically, um, you can look at other actors and see what you think works and what doesn't work and appropriate that into your way of performing. And, uh, and John and I, we did the tour together in 2010 when he played Angeras and I played Varjon. And we lived together for a period of time on the tour as well, so we became very good friends. Um, so there's no greater compliment that I can be paid, you know. And, uh, and also that version of the tour, because uh, I started it, uh, all the Valjeans since then, they've kind of had to fill the the template that I created so it gives me great pleasure that someone like John or Ramin Karimlu or Alfie Bo yeah. has to kind of follow in my footsteps it's enormously satisfying and um, it's a privilege. Mm. Uh, this year we'll also be celebrating the 90th birthday of Stephen Sondheim. Yeah. Uh, you recently spoke of your affection for Into the Woods uh, uh -huh. one of your first roles was in the National Theatre's production of A Little Night Music yeah. with Dame Judi Dench. Um, what do you think it is about Stephen Sondheim's musicals which is still generating so much interest? Uh, I think it's been because they're so extraordinarily well written. I mean, you can't deny um, the craftsmanship that goes into it. I mean, a lot of musicals nowadays are, you know, they get modern pop songs and they, they, they fit a story around it. And there's an audience for that and there's a place for that. Mamma Mia is a particular example. It's a hugely enjoyable show, um, but the craft of musical theatre writing is not really employed in it because the songs are already written and then they just pasted a story around it. Sondheim writes words and music at the same time and they fit the story. Uh, he always explores interesting, difficult themes, um, which um, y you can plunder in different ways as a performer or as an audience member. You can see new things in his writing all the time. And I try to go and see every Sondheim production I can that happens in London. It's not always possible. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing Sunday in the Park with George. Yeah. And um, I, I can tell you a little Sondheim anecdote, actually. When I worked with him at uh, the National Theatre, he said to me in front of the entire company, he said, John, you sing with great style. <laughs> It's the wrong style, but it's great style. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's well, a bit of a legend. Well, um, so nowadays there are still some people in the world who would still say that theatre is an extravagance, that it's elitist and not entirely viable for mass, and mass audiences. Um, what do you think can be done to keep theatre accessible for all? Um, well, a lot of producers now, are, you know, they're always giving out like, cheaper seats. Um, but if you want the premium experience, you, you pay the premium thing, you know, and of course that will create a divide, but um, at the end of the day it's a business. So, you know, it costs an awful lot of money to stage a musical from 
you know, the writing through the development and then the final production is an incredible risk. So, um, you know, producers want to claw back as much of that um, money as they can that they've spent on it, you know. So um, I don't think it's ever going to change. But, for example, if you look in this theatre now, you know, um, you could sell, you know, the top, the upper circle for a quarter of the price down there, you know. But a lot often, because the sheer, uh, you know, mathematics is a business, they will sell those, and people will buy them. That's the thing. So, um, you know, I'd like to see more, um, uh, you know, we used to do something called midnight matinees in the West End where you do, do stuff for charity and, and the money that the people pay would go to a charity. Um, and that's quite a fair way of doing it because there was always cheaper seats for them, you know, and the audiences always had a great time and the cast always had a great time. Um, so, but I think, um, yeah, um, it, it's, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing because it's just a, it's balancing the books. So it's an incredibly expensive business, so I don't think we're really going to see much change. But if it's a subsidised theatre like the National, um, you know, where they get public money, you know, and it's, I can see them doing it a lot more, and they do do that. But they should have every now and then they should have like a performance for I don't know homeless people or you know, um, you know sick children or something, some kind of stuff where you give a bit back. But oftentimes um, people, you know, if they want to go and see a show, they will pay top dollar. I know I have done. I'm sure you have. It's just business, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, over the years, we've also seen uh, numerous film adaptations of uh, big musicals, uh, including Phantom and Les Mis, mm -hmm. um, but also recently uh, Into the Woods, Jersey Boys, and most recently Cats. Um, I was curious, what's been your general reaction to these film adaptations? Um, well, I, uh, it's interesting, you know, I mean, back in the day, things like Carousel and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, uh, they were their own genre. They were like, they're special. There was a special time in like musical theatre, and you know the golden age of musical theatre, I call it. And you know the films were special. But nowadays, you, you know, musicals like Les Mis exist purely because of their theatricality, and it's really hard to translate that into film. But I didn't enjoy Phantom, and I wasn't a huge fan of Les Mis. But that's possibly because I'm really close to the stories and, and how the, the stories are told. And seeing it done in a different way, through a different perspective, probably I, I, I found it hard. Um, but um, and also I didn't get into either of those films so probably a bit bitter about that but um, I think it's just good to get you know I mean I think Limis has had a second life because of the film you know and um, you know people see the film and they go well, let's go see what it's like on stage and then that's it then they're addicted to going to the theatre so it's, it can only be a good thing. Um, although you're best known for your work in Phantom and Limis um, you've also performed in productions of The Merchants of Venice, um, What You Do About Nothing uh, you're, you perform frequently around the world in concerts and uh, you most recently released your sixth studio album, yeah. Spotlight. Um, as a last question, what do you most want to be remembered for? Being a nice guy, really. I mean, it's, um, I've worked with so many people in this business who are like ambitious and horrible and I just want to have, I mean, life's short, have a good time, be nice to people um, and I just want to be known as the guy that entertained people and, and, you know, took them out of what might have been, you know, a horrible day and made them happy, you know. And that's kind of the reason for the, the albums, I think, are probably going to be my legacy more than anything else. Mm -hmm because they will last long beyond me. I mean, you know, theatre, life theatre is ephemeral. It just it comes and goes, you know? And that's the beauty of it, the fact that it's not set in stone and it's like an ethereal mist. Um, but um, with, you know, my albums and stuff, um, you know, people will still be able to hear me perform and how I performed long after I'm gone. So, I mean, that, that's probably my legacy. But I would like to be remembered as someone that put a smile on people's faces, you know? John Owen James, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.